some of the stuff that you can do for your facility. Now, this is simple things, simple things to think about, folks. Um, lock your perimeter doors. Now, I don't know, um, I don't know what type of buildings y'all have. All of them are going to be different. But a good general rule to kind of control this stuff is have have one entrance, you know, one basic entrance. Your secondary doors, your perimeter doors, a lot of businesses, and this is just uh, stuff from talking to factories and different businesses I do these for, make sure that if you do have access control in your perimeter doors that your employees aren't propping them open, um, aren't, uh, aren't leaving them where you can get some type of, uh, some type of intruder could gain access through, through those. A lot of times there's an area where employees go and take a smoke break, they'll prop the door open, and it kind of undermines your security measures. Stall locks on interior doors. I'm going to get to that and the reasons for that um, when we get to kind of our response plan to respond with, a, with an armed intruder incident. So video cameras. Uh, video cameras are a deterrent. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's one of those things that are out there. I try to I, I let a lot of people know when this is just the reality of it. Um, if I'm a bad guy looking to break into a house and I'm standing in front of a house and I see one that's here that has bushes turned away from the windows, may have an alarm system sign in the front yard, um, you know, lit, may have a dog in the backyard, something like that. And then the one next door, it's dark, has bushes growing up around the windows, it don't look like anybody's been there in a few weeks. Which one am I going to break into? You know, I'm going to break into the one that looks like it's going to, I'm not going to get any resistance. I'm going to be the most, have the most chance of success. So, you know, video cameras do that. Um, they help us out post incident sometimes, um, uh, watching video or, or the, the biggest thing they do is deter crime. Um, install controlled access to your facility. Uh, some type of key card access so you know who is coming and going inside of your facility. Uh, communicate with other personnel. Now, I don't know if I have any, normally when I get to this part is where I have uh, HR representatives, smoke starts rolling out of their ears and everything, they start getting mad at me. Um, but this is the stuff that you have to remember. Communication is very important. Think about where your threats are going to come from. Um, government agency, you know, you may have a, a taxpayer that's upset about something. Um, uh, you have a very good likelihood, or well, it's probably more likely, of some type of employee that's been terminated and is upset about it. Um, that's where a lot of your threats come from. Domestic violence situations, all that stuff. So, you know, you kind of want to take them and understand where your threats are coming from. So, when we think about that, an angry employee, um, there's been several incidents in the state of Kentucky over the years in factories where active shooters have been employees that are terminated. Um, came in, tried to kill their boss, some, some co-workers. It's very important to make sure that you notify your employees of what's going on. Um, if Bob is on vacation this week and y'all fire George because he threatened another employee, Bob comes back from vacation, he's having a smoke outside the building, George walks up and says, hey, I forgot my key card. You know, he's going to get laid. Somebody's going to let him in there. When, when employees are terminated, you have to let the other employees know uh, to, to keep that line of communication open. All right. Trust your instincts. Educate yourself on body language. Don't be afraid to call the police. Um, you know, when it gets to the trust your instincts and kind of kind of trusting your gut feelings, um, this is something I try to get out, especially you want to get out to your employees. Um, you know, it's not... I can sit up here and tell you all kinds of stuff to help you interpret somebody's body language and all that. The reality of it is, how many people have had a car that's about to, they're driving down the road, the car's about to pull out in front of you, and you go ahead and hit your brakes because you can tell they're about to pull out in front of us. Happens all the time, doesn't it? So you, as a human being, that have been evaluating people's actions, their demeanors, their body language since you were born, your entire life, he was able to evaluate what that person was going to do while they were in a steel box about 200 meters away or 200 yards away as they're coming up to a stop sign. And you could tell that it's about to pull out in front of them. We have this gift, but what happens a lot of times is we suppress those gut feelings. Um, the uh, uh, shooter or attempted shooter in Nashville a couple months ago at the movie theater, Dean Dog, I'm sure y'all heard about that. The police actually engaged him, killed him before they said it happened. What do y'all think? Has anybody heard what he was wearing? when he went in and bought his ticket from the theater. <coughs> two backpacks, not one, two backpacks, and a surgical mask. Now, I don't know, I, I was a detective for a while, it's been a few years, but that may be a clue that you at least want to, you know, check it out a little bit, maybe holler security, holler a manager, something like that. So it's little stuff like that that, that, that needs to click and we need to understand. 
Um, develop a simple response plan. A lot of businesses, um, you know, medical facilities and stuff like that, they'll call me, I'll come up and, and, and they'll have, they'll say, man, we developed this SOP, you know, and we think that it's really good, it covers everything, and it'll be about 47 pages and about that big. Now, I know the jail's employees are probably different than ours, but I can tell you, trained police officers, if it's over a page, chances are pretty slim that I'm going to get them to read it. All right, so that's, that's just the way it is. Try to keep your response plans down to about a page, maybe a page and a half. Tell them to your employees, you can send it out to them in a memo or give it to them or they can put it on their desk and they can read it and they can know what their response plan is. Um, and discuss your plan with employees. That's, uh, that's a big one, having this discussion. So we talked about that and we're going to get in real quick with maybe some of the stuff that your plan should entail and the reason that you should have that in. As far as a law enforcement aspect, what you can expect from us, um, uh, just some of the quick history. Um, uh, we, we talked about, a few people mentioned Columbine. Um, that was kind of a turning point in law enforcement. Um, what, what we base our tactic at the time, the police tactics was during a serious incident to set up a perimeter wait for the SWAT team. SWAT team takes about 30 minutes to get there. A lot of people <coughs> die when they get the SWAT team. Active shooter mass homicide is a patrol level function now. We teach our patrolmen that they respond to the scene. Uh, my patrolmen, they know that when you pull it, don't ever expect for 15 guys to come rolling through your building if there's some type of mass homicide. Um, uh, it's very likely that you'll see one, maybe two officers that comes rolling into that building. We know that statistically, the first police boot that steps foot in the building during an active shooter, the bad guy is either going to force us to kill him or he's going to kill himself. Either way, we prefer the preferred method is for him to give up. Um, we know that that don't happen, but as long as he stops killing my citizens, and killing and killing people in my community, we have accomplished our mission. So I tell my officers, as soon as you get there, you come rolling into the lot. Um, if your backup is squealing tires coming in behind you by two or three seconds, maybe you can hesitate, but understand that every gunshot you hear is another one of my citizens that is being murdered. So you're going to see one, maybe two officers that are coming in, coming into that structure. Our purpose is to stop back and shoot as quick as possible. We'll proceed directly to the threat once the last shots were fired. Uh, we could be wearing a multitude of uniforms. Um, first officers on the scene will not stop to help injured persons. They'll proceed directly to the threat. Um, you know, one of the things that we teach to our officers, if I, I tell every one of them, if we're going through the door together and I catch a round of the temple as soon as I walk through the door, I fully expect them to step over my carcass and keep on trucking until they find that threat. Um, we do not have time to stop or provide aid because every shot, every gunshot is another one of our citizens that's being murdered. So that's, that's going to be our goal. We will not be stopping to help injured persons. After the threat's been contained or eliminated, we will start to uh, rescue, um, uh, rescue the citizens, get them out, and help injured people. There's a very good chance this is going to be a manpower intensive incident, so we may ask people to help us. You know, to help us. <coughs> All right, there we go. All right, real quick, how to react uh, when law enforcement arrives. Remain calm, follow our instructions, put down any items in your hands, keep hands visible at all times, avoid making quick movements. Um, good general rule, if you see us coming in, the safe place to be is where we just came from. Um, we are not, as, as law enforcement, when we're coming into this, as, as much as I wish we could, and if somebody could ever invent something like in the video games where there's a big yellow star flashing over top of the bad guy's head, that would really help us out. But until then, we have no idea who our threat is or who the bad guy is. We're not looking at uniforms, name tags, any of that stuff. What we're basically doing is evaluating um, you know, body language and compliance if somebody's listening to us. You know, if they're running past us with their hands up, Hitting in a different direction, then you know we we know chances are pretty good that they're not a threat. So a good good general rule is to head in the direction that we came from to get yourself to a safe place. Um, keep your hands keep your hands empty. It's really hard with high school kids, especially the high school girls, to get them to leave their purses behind during stuff like this. Um, I promise you, ain't nobody gonna be messing with your purse as long as you're alive. That's all that we care about. So leave your stuff behind. All right. Now this response plan, and this is stuff that you can carry across across and everything. This is a menu. It is not necessarily a, um, a, a an order of things that you need to lay out. I'm going to discuss some things with you, uh, you know, some, some things that you can do. Now, 
We talked about how long Active Shooter has been going on. And I'm standing up here. I do not want it to come across to everybody that you need to live your life in fear and think that somebody's going to kill me tomorrow when I go to the mall and I need to curl up in the fetal position and start crying. It's, it's nothing like this. It's very, very unlikely that you will be a victim of an active shooter. It's much more likely you'll be a victim of a car accident or something along those lines. But with that said, I don't expect my house to burn down tonight, but I still keep fresh smoke detector batteries in a, in, in a smoke detector, correct? All, right. All this is about mental preparation. If there is one thing that I, that, I can, that I can get across to people and have them understand is spend a little bit of your time and everything that you do mentally preparing for something that could happen. If you go to Texas Roadhouse and eat tonight, or after y'all get done here, spend 30 seconds of your life when you walk into that building and you sit down and think, what am I going to do if this place catches on fire? If it catches on fire, how am I going to get myself and my family to a safe place? Am I going to throw a chair through this window and get out the window? There's my exit. There's my exit. The way that we work, the way that our human mind works, if you do not have a plan in your brain, you're going to freeze up and you will not react. That's just the way that it is. If you have a plan, if you plan for what might happen if the place catches on fire and somebody comes in shooting, your brain's going to flip through that Rolodex and it's going to go right to that plan. And you will react. Doing something is better than doing nothing. How many people, just out of curiosity, how many people have a plan if your house catches on fire at 3 o'clock in the morning this morning or in the morning? Have a plan on what you're going to do. How many people has honestly thought about what you're going to do? All right, well, we got probably about half the group. You know, that's, that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Um, mental preparation is not about living in terror or being afraid that something's going to happen. It's just about being prepared and thinking about this stuff. So with that said, evacuate, run. If you can run and you can get away during an active shooter incident, get the heck out of there. Um, Columbine, we've discussed that a little bit. I believe it was either 10 or 11 of the children murdered in Columbine died in the library. Correct? Has anybody done a lot of research on, on that? Um, you know, I was uh, talking to another instructor, and I, I wasn't aware of this after I spoke with him, but um, that, that one of the teachers that was in that library for about four minutes was on the phone with 911. Um, telling the kids to stay under the tables. Now, she didn't know any different at the time um, because there wasn't a whole lot of this training that was out there. Well, the shooters come in, kill some of the children, um, and the survivors get up and casually walk out a door that's about 30 feet away, you know, walk away from the scene. Every one of those kids could have got up and casually walked out the door and they would be alive today. Um, so, you know, this is, this is just about thinking. Think about it. If you have a door, if I can get out of here, you know, get away. You hear the shooting on that side of the building, and there's a door there in that direction. All right, hide. Now, this is where your locks on your interior doors come in. Um, to date, there's not any of this stuff can change, you know, with the next incident. But to date, there's never been a child killed behind a, uh, a, a locked door in a, uh, in a school shooting. Um, so having some type of locks on there. Now, I have uh, different businesses, churches, stuff like that. They can't afford to put locks on their doors. You know, simple stuff. Think outside the box. You know, go to Walmart, get you some three or four dollar door wedges that you can kick under the door. It makes it a lot harder to get a door open uh, if you have one of those handy and you can kick it under the bottom of the door. Um, hide. Your hiding place should be out of the intruder's view. Find a location with thick walls and make provide <laughs> that shots are fired. Um, if possible, lock the door to the middle and close the door. Silence your cell phone. Turn off any sources of noise and lights if possible. So have a place that you can go and hide. Um, real quick, when it comes to this, something that I want to discuss. One of the one of the local businesses that I went over this stuff with, um, they uh, uh, had a receptionist that was out front, and it was a uh, it was an agency that could potentially have customers that get upset with them. Um, make sure when you are setting stuff up, whether it's your county government or whatever, that you give your employees an option when it comes to this stuff. They had um, the way that, uh, that the receptionist desk was set up; she had nowhere to run other than running through the bad guy, somebody came in shooting. She had nowhere to hide, no type of protection. There was nothing that she could do. So when you are setting up your facilities, think about this stuff. At least have a door or a direction they can get out or some type of barrier to buy them a few seconds. Um, in Owensboro, what we ask for, give us 45 seconds to a minute. Now that's all that we're looking for. Um, so if you folks farther out in the county, you, know, you're, you may need 15, 20 minutes before your, before your officers get there. And kind of base your plan off of that, how much how much time we're trying to buy. 
All right. Now, this is uh, one of the, um, you know, sometimes this is controversial. There's some of uh, this aspect of your, your response plan. Some businesses um, uh, and uh, some schools and stuff don't like to incorporate this. So I always start out by saying, saying this. When uh, Sandy Hook happened, um, I teach this stuff and I did a lot of soul searching. I have, I have an 18 year old and 18 year old twins. And I remember after Sandy Hook having a conversation with my 18 year old, he was 15 at the time, on his way to school. And, uh, you know, and I talked with him and I told him, I said, listen, I go, if somebody comes into your school shoot, I go, if you're on the first floor and there's a window close, I don't care what anybody says, I want you to break out a window, jump out that window and take off running as fast as you can. Wait until you find a police officer or you find me and everything's gonna be fine. If you can't get out of that room, I want you to make sure they turn out the lights, step up, tell the teacher, whatever, turn out the lights and try to hide. But if that shooter comes into your room and it's killing you and your classmates, you better make him earn it. Don't you go down on your knees, put your hands behind your head, and die like a sheep. You pick up whatever you have in your hands and you make him earn it. What's the difference in one of the planes on September 11th, folks? They fought. It did not hit its intended target, right? Because they fought. This is not your first option. But this is an option that you need to think about. About 50% of active shooter mass homicide incidents are ended by a citizen that's unarmed that takes action against them. Um, you know, it's and, and that's just that's that's a fact. That's that's the way that it is. We have to keep that as a vital element to us. Um, as a last resort, and only when your life is in imminent danger, you have to have that as your response plan. All right, so if there's anything, I know I went through this fast, I'm getting close on time, but if there's anything that you can take with you, always, and this is across the spectrum in what you do in your general life, always take note of the nearest exits in any structure you enter. Be aware of your environment and any possible dangers. Have basic first aid supplies, tourniquet. Um, I know I probably have quite a few veterans that are in here. You know, one of the things that in my time when I was in the Army, tourniquet was a big thing. You know, it means they're going to have to amputate your limb and all that stuff. The reality of it is, is a tourniquet is something that's very simple that can stop blood loss and modern medicine can save your life and it doesn't necessarily mean your arm, leg, whatever's going to have to be amputated. Um, a lot of lives were saved during the Boston Marathon bombing because of veterans and police officers who improvised tourniquets and stopped the bleeding and saved lives. So along with your first aid kits that you carry, it's good to kind of have, have some of them around. Take note of your shelter locations, rooms with thick walls, solid doors and locks, minimal windows. This is stuff that will take you 30 seconds when you go into a structure to think about in your everyday life. And this is kind of what you need to uh, base things off of when you're developing your plans for your employees. 